Paul says in the New Testament that God has chosen the, the weak things of this world to shame the wise, and we know that he tells the Corinthians, not many of you are wise or impressive by worldly standards. So are, are we wrong then to want to focus our efforts on culture movers, culture shakers? Is, is, is this, obviously you agree with the Apostle Paul, Tim, but how does this resonate with you and what you try to do being in Manhattan and wanting to influence people who are influencers? Well, uh, you know, I, 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 you do need to have Christians everywhere there's people. Uh, in general, I actually think that uh, the people of the world are moving into cities faster than the church is going. Um, I actually do know, partly because of the expense and all sorts of other intimidation factors, um, finding what we would consider solid gospel teaching churches in um, some of what we call the cultural centers, it's harder to find them. Uh, because they actually are, it's, it is expensive. I, I said there's, a lot, there's lots of reasons why it's not easy to live there. So at this point, rather than say I would favor reaching the elites or, and influencing the elites, I would just say I would like, I'd just like to give the elites and the elite, uh, uh, you know, the cultural centers at least as much exposure to the gospel as people have other, other places in the world. And that's actually, I think that would be good because they do have a lot of influence. Um, and I think it's, uh, it would be very wrong just to go to the least expensive and maybe less resistant places to preach the gospel and plant our churches and leave those places largely devoid of, of gospel witness. That would be very bad for culture because they do have a lot of influence. So rather than, rather than say I would, frankly, I'm in the position of not saying I want to privilege them. I would just like to catch up. And actually, I, you know, a, a quick example. There's 50,000 people a, uh, a year net gain of population in New York City. 50,000 net, okay? So from 2010 to 2030, there will be a million more people in New York City. Now that's about the population of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, how many churches are there in Charlotte, North Carolina? I don't know, but it, here's the point. Do, is there any chance that we're gonna plant as many churches in the next 20 years in New York City as there are right now in Charlotte, North Carolina? No, which means people are moving into less church places. I mean, that's just, and that's happening all over the world. And yeah, New York City is a cultural center, probably more of a cultural center than Charlotte, no offense. Um, and yet, it's, what's happening is it's becoming less and less, is more and more devoid of the gospel. So my, my burden isn't to say, let's reach the elites, though I'm often characterized as that. But saying, let's just not, <laughs> Let's just simply reach the cultural centers at least as well as we're reaching other places in the world, and uh, that's just not very easy. So, Russ, I mean, with, with your work, you are from time to time, you know, rubbing shoulders with people that the world would say are very influential, important, not the the weak things of the world. So, uh, how do you understand this? Your own sense of calling and your own, you know, search after humility and all of this. How, how do you prioritize the gospel work that you have to do? Well, I think we see examples in the New Testament of the Apostle Paul and, and others doing the exact same thing. The Apostle Paul has to deal with Agrippa, with uh, Felix, with Drusilla, with, with others who are in places of, of authority. Um, I think the, the issue comes down to whether you take a long-term view of the universe where you really understand where Christian, a Christian vision of power ultimately is. And I think that that, that means taking a James 2 uh, understanding of, uh, of the universe, where, where James warns the churches, don't privilege the people who are in costly attire, which, which is an issue of power. They're, they're the people who have great influence uh, and power in the society because don't you know that God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And so what James is not doing is saying, well, influence doesn't matter. What he's saying is you need to have a, a view of influence that is longer than just the vapor of time in which you're existing right now. And so I think that that, that, has, to, that has to, we have to constantly be challenging ourselves in terms of who matters and what real power is at the same time that, that we, we don't then refuse to speak to people who do have influence and who do have power. And I think Tim is exactly right when he says that part of the problem is a lack of confidence. And so some of the same motivations, I think, that keep people from 
uh, from preaching to the poor and, and counting vulnerable people as, as having real power. Also keep them, ironically yeah. enough, from, from interfacing with people yeah. who are influencers because they lack confidence and, and they, don't, they don't see that. So, so let me put it this way. If uh, a, an eager church planner says, I, I want to plant a church in Washington, D.C., I want to plant a church in New York City, and they give you their promotional pitch, and it's, you know, God has called us to help renew culture, help renew this city, help to, to reach people in the highest echelons of power because that trickles down to the whole culture. And that's what I'm aiming to do with this church is I, I want to reach the, the congressmen and the senators in D.C. and I want to reach the people in media and the arts in, in New York City. What, what sort of caution might you have for that kind of eager church planter? Or are you just, I love your vision, go for it? Tim? I think the first reason to go to cities, that's where the people are. Okay. You go there to reach the lost, there's more people there. The second reason is to say, if I reach the lost, I know that there will be cultural impact because these are culturally influential, influential people. I actually like the idea, to me, no, no, not being in Washington, to me as a, as a simple preacher, I say, I don't really know what the culture should look like frankly, if it was being renewed with the gospel. I don't need to find out. I'm going to convert people who live and work here, and I'm going to, talk, I'm going to disciple them, and then it's, it's going to somehow have an effect. But I don't... So in that sense, I, I guess secondarily, I know that that's going to happen. Um, I would be more afraid... I'd be a little afraid if somebody privileged that as the main reason they came to New York, for example, to... Uh, to, to uh, because they want to influence the influencer. I d in their rhetoric, if that seemed like at the top, I would, be, I would actually be kind of worried about that. But I do think they have to recognize, yeah, we do need to be here, and so that's fine. So would that sort of pitch make you nervous? It would depend, because I, I think that, of course, we have a diversity of gifts, and so sometimes you have people who, because of what God has done in their lives, their backgrounds, they have a um, a unique sort of understanding for people who are in, I, I know a church planner, who comes out of the fashion industry. And so he knows the, the lostness uh, in, in the fashion industry and he knows how to uh, engage with people in that industry. And so he says, somebody needs to be there and I think God has equipped me to be there. That's a very different thing than someone who's saying, I want to reach the fashion industry in order to uh, reach the people who influence and trickle down. Because I think that's not only, that not only has biblical problems, it also is a, a really clumsy way of understanding how culture works. Culture doesn't always work in a trickle-down uh, uh, form. I mean, just look at, at, at music uh, in the United States of America. Uh, music has been influenced by slave cultures. It's been influenced by impoverished people uh, on the streets of New Orleans in, uh, in, 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 yeah, in, in Appalachia and other places. And so I think that, I think that that's a... Uh, uh, lacks the nuance that, that culture formation actually brings. So it would, it would depend on what the person's particular background and gifts are. Though. So just last question really quickly. Is it a fair critique even of, of people like us or Gospel Coalition or what we're doing that you know you, you guys are too much aimed at bourgeoisie, upper middle class folks, you know, people of, of influence and what are you doing for the least of these, and it, is, is there a blind spot here, or is it just that the door of the Lord's opened and people don't understand the individual ministries that are going on? Tim, what would you say as we land this plane? Well, I, listen, the way I, I don't, at least if you're, it, it depends on who you're talking about. If you're talking about the Gospel Coalition, I actually think there's a pretty good amount of inf, uh, emphasis on, on caring about the least of these. Yeah, and, yeah I agree. And, and there's a pretty good amount of uh, concern that we be as racially diverse, for example, and as culturally diverse a, a body as possible. We talk about immigration. We, we talk yeah, about yeah. But here, here, I, here's how the least of these does work, by the way. This sounds a little strange, but um, in a, a, the, the powerful people tend to be the white people of Europe and, and North America. Uh, and to some degree, you might say white people are getting more secular. But it's not true about um, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And they're coming to the cities. That's the reason why, by and large, even in, in Europe, the church is growing generally uh, in, mul the, the churches that are growing are multi-ethnic. Not just, you know, not just British people, German people, white Americans, they're multi-ethnic. And, and uh, because the, the, the gospel's growing amongst very often poor people, immigrant people, uh, people who come here and work their 
hard, you know, they just work their fingers down to the bone, getting their kids into college. And by and large, I do see in New York City, where I, I guess you could put it this way, the secular people have said, we're on the side of the poor. But by and large, the poor is on the side of the evangelical. Right, right. I mean, I actually heard somebody said, say to me, who was not a Christian, it says, um, liberals have opted for the poor, but the poor have opted for evangelicalism, and it's kind of an embarrassment. Um, and uh, because secularism doesn't really appeal to them, it doesn't actually meet, it doesn't meet, it doesn't meet them where they are. And I do see that having an effect in a place like New York. I do see the elites noticing that. It's a bit of an embarrassment. A lot of the children of the poor immigrants are rising up in the professional ranks, but a far higher number of non-white people in New York professionals are Christian than the white. And they're moving on up the ladder. And I actually do see God coming up from the bottom to affect the, the elites of North America and Western Europe, and therefore that, that text continues to hold true. Yeah, it's a good last word. Thanks, guys.